and we are live on YouTube and on Zoom. Welcome everybody. It is 1pm uh, here in Sydney. We are joined by Dan Mayo in Melbourne and we've also got Diamond Early joining us from New York. So welcome everybody. I am Danielle Stein Fairhurst. I run Plum Solutions, a financial modelling consultancy and I'm a financial modelling specialist. I love financial modelling which is why I've been running these virtual meetups quite regularly uh, for most of this year. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the year and I think we have uh, one, two, just a couple more left to go before the end of the year. So um, welcome everyone. I'm going to introduce you to our two guests that are joining us today and then I'm going to hand over to them to do their thing. So firstly, we have Dan Mayo, who, who is no stranger to our virtual meetups. We've met him, uh, well, I've certainly met him a few times before. He's a widely recognized world-class financial modeler and spreadsheet specialist. He was a key member of the Model of Financial Modeling World Championships organizing team. Uh, he led the question design team for uh, Model of several years uh, in the very first uh, model of World Cup Championships in 2012. He was second in the world. So welcome, Dan. Thank you, Danielle. Hello, everybody. And uh, Dean Wood Early is uh, joining us from New York, but you are originally from Ireland. Is that right, Dean Wood? And That's right, yep. Yeah. yeah, and it's late at night for you. So thank you so much. It's quite hard to find a time that, uh, that we could all, all get together. So uh, Dimwood was also a Model Off competitor. He was on the question design team. He won Model Off in 2014. And uh, when the Financial Modeling uh, Champion World Cup Championship uh, started in this year, uh, he is currently the reigning world champion for the Financial Modeling World Cup. Yay. So we're very excited to have you here, Dimwood. Congratulations for that. Uh, he, he also runs a consulting practice. He specializes in data analysis, reporting, automation, financial modeling, and Excel training and all of that stuff. So what we're going to do today is take a look at the very popular, I think we call it letters and numbers here in Australia. In That's the UK, right. I think it's called Countdown. Yep. Uh, and what you have to do in, on the, on, in, in the game is uh, to take some random letters and make, um, and, and make some words out of it. And the guys are going to show us a couple of different approaches for how to do this in Excel and take us through how Excel can be used as a computer program um, as whilst they do that. So uh, before we start, though, I'll just mention uh, the chat. So feel free for those of you who are joining us live. So hi, Ron. Ron is joining us from Winnipeg in Canada. Wow. So say hi to us in the chat. Make sure that you uh, uh, address all panelists or, and, and attendees, not just us, otherwise nobody will see your comments. And if you have questions, particular questions for them, for me or for the guys in um, Q&A, you can pop your questions in there or you can pop them in the chat, we'll be keeping an eye on that. So feel free to do that. Or if you're joining us on YouTube, uh, you can pop it in the chat as well. So um, I'll hand over to Dan, I think he's gonna go first. Yeah, thanks Danielle, um, hello everybody. So yeah, this I guess came about. Look, I've known Diem for a number of years. We met through Model Off, and over those years, we've often enjoyed, um, you know, sharing with each other different Excel challenges and how we can, um, you know, use Excel beyond just pure financial modelling to to do different tasks. You know, solve recreational mathematical problems or program solutions to games or, or things like that. And so we thought this would be a good example to, um, I guess, to try our hands at um, solving this particular sort of letters game from the, the Letters and Numbers game show. Um, and, uh, you know, DMED will take a, a sort of a power query approach and I'll use a, a more of a formula uh, approach. And I suspect if DMED went with a, a formula approach, you'd probably come up with a more efficient one than mine as well. But uh, so, yeah, it was really just for a bit of fun to, to talk about that and, um, you know, go through our thought processes and how, you know, we arrived at the at the solution. I think the reason uh, we decided to do this, Dan, was when you did the Financial Modelling World Cup 
uh, competition and we showed you guys live and you guys were just modelling away and just going as fast as you could and we thought it would be good if you were able to explain your thought process, processes. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, we're not doing any modelling on the fly in this one. We've pre-built the, uh, the, the answers. Um, but, you know, this, I mean, this is not too far different from, say, in the past model off the finals, um, not so much the earlier rounds, particularly the finals might have one kind of game type question that, um, you know, would people might have, you know, somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes to, to solve. Um, and we did have a Scrabble related one one year, which Gemma did quite well in, um, that I wrote. And... And so I took some ideas from that for, for this as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, in hindsight, I think this would be a challenge to do in, in sort of 45 minutes. When I first thought of the question, I thought, yeah, 45 minutes sounds perfectly fine. Um, but maybe that's just because I spent too much time trying to make my workbook look a bit presentable for external sharing. So anyway, with that, um, I'll share my first workbook. Daniel, did people have the ability to download this? Did that go out in the link today or not? I just sent them a copy of the words and I thought we'll send the solutions with the follow-up okay, yep. email. Uh, that's fine. I wasn't sure. Um, so yeah, the workbooks you'll see will make, get made available to everybody afterwards. Um, so we start with, and this you did all have, was a list of words um, 279,000 long. This is just what's allowable in Scrabble. And so it's all from two to 15 letters. Um, there are obviously longer words in English, longer than 15, but they're not in this list. Um, and then that's just sort of the reference to basically the challenge is given this is seven letters in this case, and I'll show you a, another file shortly with nine letters. Um, Rejumbling all those letters, what's you know all the different possible words you can make from from this list is is the challenge. So why I'm showing you this seven letter case first was because the method I used here was the first kind of thought process I had. Um, it was, I think was the first one that came to me and is a bit simple to describe, but it doesn't quite work more than seven letters. It would certainly run into memory issues with, with Excel with, with nine letters. And so I needed a different approach there. But so I'll just touch on this very quickly and then we'll move to the nine letter approach. Broadly, what I, I thought of doing here was taking the, the seven letters, um, getting a essentially a, a list that was um, seven factorial, so 5,040 rows long. Um, and then basically this 5,040 rows has all of the different um, combinations of the numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven arranged in different orders. And then using that to grab the letters. So if we look at this row, it's, you know, seven, one, three, five, two, four, six. So that's of the seven letters I programmed in the seventh, the first, the third, the fifth, the two, the fourth, the sixth. And then looking at that for, you know, does that seven letter string exist? Um, I can also then say, does the first six of that as a string exist? Because this will cover all of the six letter strings. If I just took the first six of those, there will be repeats, obviously. Um, not repeats in the six case, but there'll be repeats in the five case and the four case and so on and so on. So it's almost a brute force. It is a brute force, yeah, and, and the crux of it is coming up with a formula way to, to list those 5,040 uh, numbers. And this is something I've done in other models for other recreational Excel sheets before. So, um, you know, I've, I'm not going to talk about this formula, but that is a formula where with a few helper columns here and a helper top row and the first one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, pre-programmed. This is just a common formula that gets dragged across and down and works and will list everything there, uh, all the different combinations. And then, yeah, it's a straight out brute force. I've used dynamic arrays here just um, because I can. And actually this writing this exercise was the first time I had really tried using dynamic arrays. I haven't um, used them in my professional financial modeling work so much yet because 
there's always there's no guarantees my clients have access to them and so i've been steering clear of them um, so this was an interesting exercise for me personally just to jump into to using dynamic arrays and where i've got a, a sort of a shaded font that's just a, an indication for me that that's where i've entered a dynamic array formula and so here that's one dynamic array formula that covers all of that it's been entered here um, i could do this as well without dynamic arrays but it was a lot simpler with them um, yeah brute force all the sevens and then you can see here i've just taken basically the left six characters of all of those and then you get a unique list of that to get all the sixes so same thing here the left unique list of all the sixes five characters long get all the fives and then it's just a straight brute force and then i've just got here a, a straight out you know is that in the list of words i've filtered all of these words by length and so that just had a dynamic array length formula using the filter function based on that length i've got a dynamic array list of all of the seven six five four three and two letter words in the list and this is how many there are um, this is the sort of thing you would probably just do once stationary and like manually copy and paste if you weren't using dynamic arrays and yeah then it's just uh you know are they in the list or not yep if they are kind of using again the sort by function grab them all and then finally collecting that to get them all out this worked fine the challenging part was really just you know coming up with this list of all the seven factorial orderings of the numbers one through seven and then kind of figuring out how to go from this table here to say all oh, of my brute force strings are words or not and finding a neat way to package and present that on on the interface and um the problem is though that if you extend this to nine factorial which is about three hundred sixty-five thousand rows it just grinds to a whole even at eight with which 40,000 rows it was struggling um so i needed a different approach for, for nine so i'll show that one now okay so same setup with the words list same setup with the filtered words although here i've got it beginning at sort of nine and so you can see there's actually worse we had a maximum of thirty-four thousand before there's even more eight and nine letter words in the list. Um, same kind of presentation of the output, but a completely different back end on, on these two sheets here. Um, broadly, the approach I took now was I grabbed these nine letters, I sorted them in alphabetical order, and then I again took a, a brute force approach but i used um basically two to the power of nine is 512 and so i got a brute force list of 512 basically uh options of essentially the numbers zero through 511 in binary which would be equivalent to saying for each of these nine positions is the letter or is the position on or off and so what I mean here is I've got this little table here, this binary list goes down to 512. Again, this is just made nicely by one dynamic array formula, equivalent to what we looked at before with how do we come up with a, a brute force list of all the seven factorial combinations here. I'm, how do I get a brute force list of all of the 512 ways of having each switch on or off? And if you go through this here, you'll see it follows a pattern off on off on off on with here it's two offs two ons two offs two ons four offs four ons four offs four ons and you could write this without dynamic arrays with a bit of thought similar to how we did it you could write it very easily with dynamic arrays actually just by making use of this decimal to binary sequence where i'm just taking the numbers one through 512 or possibly zero through 511, I'm not sure. Um, converting that to binary gives me the exact sort of set of brute force on and off flags that I want. 
Nice, cool. I've not um, seen that. Yeah, so that was that was a light bulb moment for me when I figured I could actually do this with one dynamic array formula. <laughs> Um, and I like your example across the top with modeling. Great choice of words. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, and great spelling as well of modeling. I like well, it. Well, you'll see it, it. The eight letter version with one L is in the list as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what I'm then doing is modeling turns into an alphabetical order D E G I L L M N O. And I'm then, there's only 512 ways you can sort of pass this, you know, or break this up into obviously one letter words, there would only be nine. You would just take each of the individual letters. Uh, two letter words, there would be, you know, you could have DE or you could have DL or you could have D and that L or you could have D and O or you could have M and N. And all of those are going to be represented by the rows within these 512 that have two ones. So this here would be N and O, whereas say uh, this one here would be L and O. And that's what's coming out here. These are all gonna be sorted in alphabetical order because that was sorted in alphabetical order. And then I'm basically comparing this to having done the equivalent thing on the words. And so I've got the 42,009 letter words. I've broken those up into just putting them in the letters in alphabetical order. And so that's why I've got this tab word sorted list. And that's what's in here. And again, making use of some more um, dynamic arrays. So that's the letters of aardvarks, but sorted into alphabetical order. There will be repeats in this list, obviously, because you might have the same nine letters could form two different words. Um, and we we deal with that. There's a right hand side to this sheet that's, that's basically breaking it up. And so here you can see I've taken aardvarks, I've taken the next word, I've taken the next word and so on. And then just separating the words out into the individual letters and then sorting them and concatenating them there. And I've done that for the nine, the eight, the seven, the six, the five, the four, the three, and two. Um, and so now what I'm trying to do is, and let's look yeah, at I it. Just, I have to just throw in there, I one of my approaches involved trying to sort the words as well. And I'm very jealous of how easily you can do that with dynamic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, whilst this would work without dynamic arrays, it would be a lot longer to do. And it might be the kind of case where you would say, I'm going to build this model assuming this list is stationary. And so you can do, you, you might use manual steps of like manual copy, paste of values, sort, and so on. And so what you would end up with here would be eventually the same list, but it wouldn't be dynamic in that, if we change something in the master words list here, right now, this would all automatically update. This would all automatically update, but without dynamic arrays, I imagine the way I would do that would uh, would not automatically update because just for simplicity, I would have, you know, a lot of the things like removing duplicates and sorting and so on, um, you might do as manual steps because it's just, whilst well, absolutely possible to do with regular formulas, um, for an exercise like this, I would say it's not worth the effort because we're not expecting this list to update. So, yeah, and I, I, I it's, it's great that you haven't had to resort to a VBA solution either. That sort of without the dynamic arrays, I think you probably would have ended up there. Did you consider that? Um, I, I probably wouldn't have because I'm very comfortable with formulas. And look, I've certainly written models in the past where I am essentially taking a list of names that might have duplicates. And I'm writing formulas to both sort and remove the duplicates to end up with a unique sorted list. And once you know how to do that, um, you, you can do that, you know, relatively easy with formulas. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of worksheet space. It's a lot of helper cells. It's a lot of calculation overhead. Um, a lot easier with the dynamic. And if you're not part. expecting the need for it to be dynamic, um, you, you might just do it in a static way, you know, where you're actually using up on the ribbon, you know, the sort and the remove duplicates and so on as kind of 
one-way operations that can't be undone but and are not live linked but get the job done um like ron is on team power query love it yeah <laughs> yeah so we had it we got a couple of questions here is that okay if we uh yeah, well, yeah. Why are seeing the questions probably because they're in the chat box oh they're in the they're in the chat yeah we can people put them in the q a or, or in the chat uh, so, yeah, Ron's uh, mentioned uh, Power Query and Pivot Tables, but we might leave that for Jimwood because I think that's kind of his approach. And, and yeah, it's absolutely right. I think Power Query's got certainly got a place here. But Henry has asked, how did you deal with repeating letters? So if something has E and E, uh, and E and E again is like yeah. around the other way, but I think you mentioned that it just automatic that would come up as too Well, it, it gets taken care of here um, in, in, I think, this it's only one of these steps. Not here. There's still repeats there. Um, but it gets taken care of in the, in the process, um, in this approach. And so you can see, like here, we've got two L's in modeling. And so, um, you know, the one and one there should be it the same twice. As, yeah, as the one and one here, um, as the one and one there. And so you've got LN and LN both appearing there. Mm -hmm. um, but that will still get sorted here, basically, because I got the unique function there. All right. Um, and so that does the job. And so whilst I've got 512 items in this list, I've only got 383 items that are unique in this list. Um, because because of the else. Yeah. If we had a nine letter word with no repeating letters, this would also be 512 long. Um, so essentially that's dealt with with the unique function there. And so now I'm just looking at comparing this list, which is maximum of 512 long, and in this case only 383 long. And I'm comparing that against all of these lists here, um, which will have some repeats in them. And we want some repeats in this. Um, the four letter word stop, for example, STOP could also be the four letter word pots. Now, if we had um, chosen nine letters that included STOP, we would see many, many occurrences of um, OPST, which would be the alphabetical sorting of that and you can make six different words with the letters O, P, S, T. So that would occur in this list six times. Um, and that's fine. Right now, we've actually already got the letters D, E, G, I, L, M, N, which is seven letters and make melding, for example. They appear in this list uh, three times in here. And that basically just means there's three anagrams of those seven letters, melding, and then two anagrams of melding that would be in our master list here. Um, and that's what's showing up there. And it's basically saying within this list of words here, the 17,855th, the 17,902nd, and the 18,222nd are all made up of those seven letters. Um, and here, Conceptually, you know, it's it's. I've got this now only maximum five hundred and twelve list of, of letters. I'm comparing against my database, and if we had ten instead of nine letters, this would be only a thousand and twenty-four. Still quite manageable. Um, and it's just then looking through, you know, what column it has to look up here is is determined. Sorry, here is determined by the length of the word, so that's easy. Um, and then you know, we get basically ticks for how many there are and words that have nothing will get zero. Strings that have one will get an item here. Strings that have two will get an item there as well and three and so on. I've had to build in a structural maximum here and I'm putting 15. I'm just assuming there's going to be no string of letters that has 15 anagrams or more than 15 anagrams. But I put in a check just in case. And that shows up on the interface if you know all your checks aren't working. Uh, and then the challenge is, is really just 
again, turning this into a neatly packaged list that can be on the interface. The, the crux of the problem is done at this point in identifying kind of how many, you know, anagrams you can find of each length um, and where they are on the list. But it's then sort of having to look them up on this list, go back to the same position here where they were not alphabetically sorted and then find a way to return it onto, onto this page here. Um, and I'm not going to spend time going through the formulas, but there's just a whole bunch of sort of helper columns over there that do it. Um, cool, cool. I'm having flashbacks from that. I do say so myself. I had to use the X match function here in a way that match wouldn't have worked, um, you know, because you're making use of subtle differences when you've got um, multiple occurrences in the array of the item you're looking to match and then does the formula return the first occurrence or the last occurrence? And that's difference between that's different between match and X match, and it's different between whether you look um, for an exact match or an approximate match, and, and so on and so on. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's it's. So would, how many how many did you get? And if I hadn't already known it, I would have learned more about different match functions and other ways doing this as well. So it's a nice little learning exercise. Um, I'll. Stop so what sharing. was your total? What was the number? Total number of what? Words. Uh, well, in the case of modeling, there's um, one nine letter word, there's one eight letter word, there's 12 seven letter words. Um, I'll just share this again one more time before I hand over to Dimit. And say if I, if I put in a word like, um, you know, restarted, for example, Scrabble players will know that, you know, T, R, S, A, E, um, have oh, lots of anagrams. Yeah, this is where it really, yeah, yeah, this is cool. You know, if I put in, say, restarted, you can see there's 14 eight letter words, there's 113 five letter words. Yeah. I, I've got a structural limit here of 300. There, I originally had 200, and then I tried an example. I forget what the word is now, but I tried an example, and it Returned over two hundred five letter words, so I have to cool. extend it. So, um, so yeah, there's there's quite a lot, but it, look, it seems to work. Hopefully, it gets the same results that Diamonds does. That's um, great. All right. Uh, the question: How long did this take me to create? Um, writing both models, this one and the one, the seven letter one you just saw, I actually kind of did yesterday afternoon, having already had the idea of how germinate in my head for a while, and it probably took me about three hours for the pair. Um, but a lot of that was making it look pretty. That was also reduced by already having the formulas done to get those brute force lists of the of the seven yeah. strings or the 512 binary wow. strings. You'd probably add, you know, half an hour if you were trying to come up with those from scratch. So. Very impressive, Dan. So yeah. Jim, what did you think? You've seen it before. I, I liked it. Um, I, I was actually, funnily enough, the, the thing I was going to ask you to talk about if you hadn't was the structural integrity check, because that's uh, like, I mean, I, yeah, I like and, the whole and thing. The but... seven letter case didn't need any structural integrity checks because it was all another advantage of dynamic arrays. The things can just grow as long as they need. Um, and I could write all the formulas in there referencing the dynamic arrays so they would spill to be as long as they needed or, or grow to be as long as they needed. That wasn't the case with the nine letter one. I had certain formulas that um, I couldn't quite figure out how to, to automatically make grow to the required length. So I just had to build in a structural maximum length and put in checks, which is a very common way or a common technique from financial modeling for dynamic arrays were around. You well, would... I would say it's, it's very common to build structural limits into your model. It's yeah. less common to build an acknowledgement of that into your model, which is what I liked about it. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I enjoy my integrity checks. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I use the cell styles a lot and the, the checks that say, okay, it's just a zero and the checks that say error, it's just a one. Um, and it's just custom number formatting to, to kind of make it appear that way. Um, and when you put those in your cell styles, they're very quick to apply and, and so on. So, yeah. Your turn, Diamond. All righty. Um, so your approach was a bit different, Diamond. 
Yes, quite different, quite different. <laughs> uh, I mean, so a couple of things. One is like different, um, different conceptually, which I'll explain in a second, but also different implementation, which is I, I did my implementation in, in Power Query and I'll talk a little bit about some of the kind of pros and cons of, of the switch as well. I, I, let, let me start with that and then I'll talk about the, the conceptual side. Um, so like Dan mentioned that, you know, a lot of the, the sort of workings for this file are things that, um, you know, under different circumstances or if it got any bigger or whatever, you would probably kind of do once and then copy value paste or make stationary. Um, and like one of the things that I like a lot about Power Query is it, it effectively gives you something that's in between having kind of calculations turned off and having calculations turned on, which is you have a query that you can refresh if you want to and when you need to, uh, but that is not refreshed as part of a recalculation. So, you know, in other words, if this, either if this was like part of another model or, you know, if just the word list was, you know, the word list was something else that was much bigger or whatever. Like if there's a lot of calculation going into something like, say for example, taking the word list and sorting each of the hundreds of thousands of words in that into like each of the characters in alphabetical order, that's a calculation that, you know, you're gonna to want to do once. You're not gonna need, you know, as your input word changes, if it changes, like let's say you, you know, you pull this, uh, this sheet up every time there's a countdown show on TV so you can get the answers before and see them all sweating. Uh, you know, your input word changes all the time but your dictionary never changes. And so having it where you can like do all the work of processing the sort of extract transform load with that data once, but in a way, so in a way that records all the steps and keeps it there, which is better than kind of copy value pasting, but also in a way that doesn't add any calculation overhead when you don't need to refresh it. If it's something that like, you know, in, in the real world, maybe it's like data that's refreshed once a week or once a month, but you do a bunch of other, So, like in, in my job, I do a lot of, I use Power Query a lot for reporting where, you know, weekly or monthly data sets come in, which are quite large and need lots of different kind of processing and rules applied and so on. Um, and then there's a sort of, call it presentation layer on top of that, that, you know, makes pretty reports. Um, and so that part kind of recalcs all the time, but if you tried to have live formulas for all of the extraction transformation, et cetera, then it would be, it would be too big an overhead. Um, anyway, okay, that's, that's enough kind of chit chat. Let me share my screen. I'll give you a quick uh, overview of, um, like I said, I had a slightly different kind of concept for, for approaching the problem. So I'll show you that first and then show you some of the actual workings of it. So conceptually, like Dan started from a place of, you know, take the input word, generate kind of candidate words and match them against the list, broadly speaking. Um, the way I thought about it was, I basically thought of it in terms of how many of each letter are in the input word and how many of each letter are in each of the other words. So whatever, let's say your word was, I, I don't have, I'm trying to zoom in so that it's not too small here. So I don't have example, I don't have wide enough to do example, but let's say your word is dad, right? Then you've got, you know, two Ds and one A. And so let's say the, the input word was, I don't know, fade. Then you've got an F and A, a D and an E. And so you've covered the A, you've covered one of the Ds, but you haven't covered the second D, right? So basically the ability to, to match a word is basically the count of that, of every letter in your input is greater than or equal to the count of that letter in the word you're trying to match against. And so the kind of, I'll, I'll show you a few different kind of ways of getting at that, but the core of my idea was basically letter by letter, look at, you know, is there enough of this letter to get you what you want? So, like I said, a few, few different ways that I thought about doing that. Um, they all obviously start off with, well, hang on, let me just pull one up. Do, 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 do. So I've called this one formula solution one bad uh, because it's bad. It's extremely inefficient, but it's the starting point. Uh, I should warn you, I know Dan has like a very whizzy computer. My laptop is super, super I don't normally work with files like this on my laptop. 
I do sometimes on my work computer, but not on this. So it's, it's going to creak as we open up these hundreds of thousands of row uh, files, which in this case is because the file is inefficient, but on, on the other ones, it's partly because the file is inefficient, but mostly because my laptop is inefficient. I'm, I'm a little well, surprised. While you're waiting it's not for that, I'll address that that question that Henry just asked, which was would the intelligent calc in Excel deal with only recalculating when needed upon change cells, assuming no volatile functions? And um, I mean, yes is the short answer. And uh, I mean, even before the recent refreshes to Excel's calc engine, it would still it would still have behaved that way, um, which is to say when Excel recalcs, it tries to only change the things it needs to change. Um, but in order for it to do that, it needs to store a, you know, a, what the, is called a calculation tree, which is sort of it keeping track of what are all the cells that are dependent on other cells and which were dependent on themselves, other cells, essentially a way of it knowing what does it need to update when you change something. Um, and even though I did try to use efficient formulas and try to use certain functions that were not going to be uh, a drag, you know, compared to some other functions, um, you still run into, you know, to issues when you're, you're working with lists that are, you know, 300,000 rows long and you're doing multiple calculations over and over and over again on them. So, um, but it is, I think, useful for anyone wanting to be better at, at um, working with Excel professionally. Do learn how it works under the hood. Uh, do learn what functions uh, are more efficient than other functions. There's you know, crashing ways to time them themselves. And then time. choose formula approaches um, that take advantage of those efficiencies. Mm. Yeah, and I think the more you sort of play around with these things, you know, the more likely you are to, to you know, you're expanding your skill set and your toolkit and the more functions you know, the more likely it is that you're going to find one that that will, will work in a certain situation. Yeah. Or even, you know, there'll be two different ones that will both work, but one will be 10 times quicker. Mm. Yeah, there's always multiple ways of achieving yeah. a similar result. I often find, you know, like this kind of, it's almost like muscle memory, you know, when you are trying to solve something, even though this is recreational, it's not a work-related solution, but something like that, you know, it'll be in the back of your mind. So if you've solved something like this and you get into a work situation, you'll be like, I've done this. Yeah, and sometimes kind of it's just one piece of the puzzle that you use to solve here. Um, you get to reapply in an actual work situation, yeah, particularly if, if, a, lot of the, if a lot of it is, you know, if a lot of the work is around just taking subsets of lists and repackaging how they're presented, you know, resorting them, um, showing them a different way, you know, filtering them or summarizing them a different way, um, which is what a lot of financial modeling, you know, tends to be <laughs> beyond the, the bare bones calcs. It's um, there's certain techniques that, yeah, you do recognize as, as coming up again and again. Mm. So uh, let me just, I, the, the bad one that had the whole thing open, apparently just my computer is too unhappy with that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that one for now. Um, but uh, where are we? Yeah. Um, so the, this is the kind of mini, mini version of that, which is basically you've got your letters along the top how many of each of those letters there are. And the idea is, okay, figure out, are there too many of that letter? So one way that you can do that, not a computationally efficient way if you have 300,000 rows and 26 columns, is to say, basically, well, what does something look like if it has, uh, sorry, this should be plus one. What does something look like if it has uh, too many A's in it? Well, if, if, it's, if there are two A's that you can cover, then a problem is if it has three A's. And if you have text wildcards, then you can say something that has three A's is wild star, which is just any text, then an A, then any other text, then an A, then any other text, then an A, then any other text, right? Yeah. And so you can basically, for each word and for each letter, you can say, does it have too many A's? And the answer in this case is no, it doesn't have too many A's. Does it have too many B's? No, it doesn't have too many B's. 
does it have too many X's? Yes, it does, because there are zero X's and this has one. Okay, so basically any time one of these turns up a one, uh, you've got a problem. And so you can do this for 26 columns and then take the max of that and say, if that's, you know, if it trips any letter as being a problem, then it fails. And so you can filter for the ones where the max is a zero, meaning every letter is a pass, meaning, you know, it never has more of any letter than it's supposed to. So, you know, simple idea, but obviously, like I said, it means that you have to do a live formula in each of 300,000 rows by 26 columns, um, which is why it was, you know, super inefficient. So that, that's kind of step one. Uh, step two was uh, basically generating, rather than doing uh, these kind of text strings, it was just to go straight to the numbers. So let's say your input word has two A's, then you'd count how many words, again, whatever example, focus, focus, whatever, you know, list of words going down here, I'll open up a real file again in a minute. Uh, so for each one of those, you would say, okay, how many A's are there in this? And is that more or less than that? And so this is uh, one that may be familiar to people or not, but I, I use it a lot. Like if you want to know how many A's are in something, the neatest way I know how to do that in Excel is to substitute the A's out of it. So use substitute to replace all A's with blanks, take the length of that and subtract it from the length of the original thing. And so this has one A, I'm um, sorry. Okay. So, oh. well, I saw a similar example of that actually in um, the, the uh, in document that the Excel team put out about the new Lambda function, which we won't talk about here, but an example they gave was counting how many words are in a sentence. And they basically did the same thing, saying the length of the sentence minus the length substituting the spaces with blanks and then wrapping around a trim function as well and, and whatnot. And, um, yep. Yeah. It, it, pretty clever. <laughs> yep. I, I use it a lot for like how many emails are in this string or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you can also use it for something that has more characters. So like if this is, I don't know, how many instances of comma space are there in the thing, uh, then you can just, you know, divide by, so like whatever thing you get, if replacing all the comma spaces with blanks shortens it by six characters, then there's three instances of comma space because it's two characters long. So you just take this and divide by the length of whatever you're summing out. But obviously here we don't need to do that because there's only one character. So basically the idea is you get a, a list of numbers. So whatever, there's one A, zero Bs, one X, and so on. Uh, and then you can do a formula to compare, okay, is, are all of these greater than all of these? Uh, which could be something like, um, well, hang on, let me just, I'll open up my real file now. Uh, I'm reasonably sure it'll let me do this one, but don't want to jinx it. <laughs> so that was formula solution three, I think. My computer is no, crawling along. Watch that status bar. Okay, somebody talk about something else for a while. <laughs> Um, anyway, so the, the formula I used to kind of pull it all together was uh, whatever, like an array formula max of, you know, the letters down below minus the letters up at the top. Because uh, again, if, yeah. if in any case, there are more of the one in that row than there are up at the top, then it can't cover that word. Um, if, if you had done this demo with a, say, a proof of concept word list that was only a thousand words long instead of 270,000 words long. That would have made a lot of sense, but then I wouldn't yeah. have been able to check your answers down, which is surely no, no, half. But, but I mean, it, I, <laughs> it's an interesting point that when we think about the scalability of our solutions, you know, and, you know, let's say if you ended up with a, you know, a list three million words long, you know, then does either of our approaches break down? Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but it's... Um, Power Query doesn't break down, Dan. Believe oh, in Power Query. Yeah, your laptop will, but Power Query will That's good. <laughs> Which, and so this is, this is like first intro to Power There's There's like a more Power Query-ish solution coming, but I'll, I'll start with this one, which is uh, basically I use Power Query to, so like I said, th there's one piece of this, like the, the thing that makes, in my mind, makes this solution better than the other one is there's still, you know, 26 columns by 300,000 rows 
uh, that need to be calculated, but those calculations all depend only on the word list and not on the input word. Whereas yeah. the one that was count ifing between the two of them, all all 26 columns had to be recalculated. Yeah, so time. once this is done, you end up with essentially a static table of 300,000 by 26. Exactly. So what, what I've done is I've used Power Query to take the word list and do everything up to column Z or Z, depending on where you're from, uh, and then just added in a formula in the last column, which looks for, yeah, so the, the minimum of the number you have to cover minus uh, the number required. Yep. And if that's ever negative, then you're broken. And so you just do that, and then you filter to zero, and those are all the matches. Eventually, there it is. So, and one of the nice things about this approach, kind of conceptually, is mm. it, there's basically no, on the length of no the scale yeah. So, you know, if you want to sort of, therefore, uh, art thou Romeo. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas my, my approach, at least my second approach, would work with a seven-letter word as well as a nine-letter word, or it would work with a five-letter input word, but it won't work with a ten-letter input word. You know, it would require uh, structural reprogramming to to have longer input words. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is so another very one... useful lesson for real-world modeling is when you start planning a solution, anticipate the goalposts will move a little, but try to understand what hard limits there will be on where the goalposts can move and design around yep. that <laughs> yep. very sensible um and so yeah basically the way this works you just you type in a new word and then you you know refresh the filter so that it's back to back to all the things with zeros um so that's kind of semi power query solution number one um and then just very quickly i'll show you the other one because I, I mentioned that i had a solution that turned on kind of sorting the letters of the word into order. So kind of similar idea. So basically the idea was, what does a word that you can cover with whatever example look like? Well, if you put the letters of both in order, uh, so you put you sort the letters of, of your input string in alphabetical order, you sort the letters of your word list in alphabetical order, then as long as you can get from the thing in the word list that's sorted in order to your input string by adding in something else in between, then it's covered. And if you can't do it that way, then it's not covered. And so one way to do that with Excel is basically to sort this and then put stars in between everywhere and then do a count if just on one cell. And if this string is a match for that one, which is basically just saying if this with the letters sorted in order uh, by adding in more letters can become this, then you've got a match and otherwise you don't. Uh, and so again, you know, I generated, actually, let me just show you the, the query here. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Well, you seem to have glossed over the, uh, the final presentation step of, you know, showing all of the matches in a nice neat little, uh, you know, table or something. <laughs> this is this is beautifully presented. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, it's like you got to keep changing your your auto filter or you know things like this. Uh, yeah, hard to please. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so let, let me just show you the. Uh, I am going to the advanced editor. Uh, so this is the code. We were talking about this before. Unfortunately, I don't have a nice way to make this big, but high level, what this is doing, you'll see there's like 26 columns in the middle. Um, I Maybe if you're smarter with Power Query than I am, you know how to make like one formula that generates all 26 of those. Something tells me if Ken Pulse was here, he would say, wait, there's a better way. Uh, I'll talk about that part in a second. But conceptually, what this is doing is uh, it's pulling in the, uh, the word list as a file. Uh, just like renames it because it comes in just as column one to word, adds the length of the word, sorts it by length for the nice presentation of the output table, Dan. <laughs> uh, and then adds in, basically builds up the sorted words. So that what, what this is actually doing is saying, you know, start off with just a star, which is the wild card at the start, then yeah. repeat A star as many times as there are A in, in the word, repeat B star as many times as there are B, and just keep adding that onto the same thing. So uh, why, 
why do you go for power query over something like VBA? You know, I mean, at the start of when your presentation, when you were speaking about how power query, you know, is that halfway step and you can have things just, you know, execute a string of routine or repeated actions just on demand. Uh, VBA would be very similar. Uh, so why have you chosen? Yeah, so a, a couple of things. Um, one is um, I find it easier to write Power Query, like mm -hmm. for the things that Power Query can do, it's it's a lot easier to like. I don't, I didn't write this code for the most part. I, you know, you can do the steps over here in the user interface, like you can just say filter or group or whatever. Yep. Um, it's it's pretty easy to write it. And the other thing is, I would say broadly speaking, I find Power Query much more, um, call it robust. Okay. Um, like, you know, I find VBA is very, you know, grumpy if, you know, you specify a range and the range moves or anything like that. Like Power Query is quite flexible if, let's say, you know, you say open up this file and then get me the revenue column. Like Power Query doesn't care if three more columns have been added and revenue yeah. has moved from Q to T or something like that. Um, so like- Yeah, I mean, and that, that's interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's correct and I, I'm sure you're also correct that, you know, it recording you doing the steps and turning that into the code does a lot better job than the macro recorder in VBA does um, when you're trying to do the same. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I, you know, I'm comfortable with VBA and I started learning that before Power Query was a thing. And I still haven't really learned Power Query. Um, you should. So great. Given the choice of having to do something in one of those two, I'm going to steer towards VBA. But you make a good point for someone who's who's kind of new to both skills and then thinking about which one is worth learning first. Um, yeah, yeah, I would like say there's, there's enough be more useful. Power Query, there's enough that Power Query is better at and better by enough in my view that, so like I, I, I was, you know, a person who was comfortable with VBA and had never come across Power Query. Um, and and like with, with the kind of reporting stuff that I do, it was just, it was getting too unwieldy to do in VBA and to keep up with the changes. And I started, you know, testing out doing it in Power Query and it was for the same thing. And I found it a lot better. I mean, you know, your, your mileage may vary, obviously. Um, yeah, I, uh, I often find uh, I'm a bit like you, Dan. I... Uh, having come from a background of modeling, we so used to using the formulas that I had to really force myself to use Power Query because you know that it's, you've sort of got to get your skills up in, in, in both. Certainly, we, uh, we actually did a debate last week on Power Query versus formulas. Sounds like we need to do another one on Power Query versus BBA. I mean, potentially, I think, yeah, there's cases where you know problems you could solve with one or the other um absolutely it'd be worth thinking about but it's uh you know there, there's no there's not a black and white winner you know if there's no whichever one is better in this case it's not going to be the best in every case you know no and having but but i think as a as a modeler you know having the skills to yeah, it's, to it's draw on about from a skill set point of view particularly if you're if you're kind of new or you know, still learning and then you're choosing, I'm going to learn one or the other, but I don't have time to learn both right now. You know, it's quite interesting. Yep. Okay. So was, I, was, was that it, uh, Uh No, I've got, I got one, more, one more trick up my sleeve okay. uh, to, just to kind of showcase one more nice feature about Power Query, uh, because if you take a look, you will see that all my formula-based files are, you know, it 10 plus, <laughs> 10 to 60 yeah, megabytes. See, for context, um, mine were only about uh, 5 and 12 megabytes. You know, five your, your, yours are XLSBs, which yeah, helps I mean, them. That, that makes it a little bit smaller. But, but you know, here's much. my Power Query solution is 21 kilobytes. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I, and if I wrote um, a VBA code, and, it would be similar. And so, that, like I mentioned that I had... I had kind of migrated to Power Query not entirely voluntarily. Part of the reason that I did was because, you know, whatever the the new data that comes in every week for the reporting that I work on probably comes to like 50 plus megabytes. Mm -hmm. And so it got to the stage where all of that data being in the file, even with like the most efficient formulas in the world, it's still the file was getting large, slow, unstable, problematic. So one of the great things about Power Query is you can 
you can pull the data from an external source, um, but only keep the parts that you're interested in. So for example, in this case, you know, I've got a couple of parameters, which is, you know, where is the word list and what is the input word? And then I've got a query. And the only thing that stays in the file is whatever the output words are, which in this case is 73 words. Um, and, you know, similar, like when I'm doing the reporting, like if there's a hundred thousand rows of, you know, what bank or what client, what, you know, product to the 17th layer of the hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera, these revenue credits were booked in, but I only care about, you know, whatever banker and high level product, then I can aggregate that and just have, you know, pretty, pretty minimal data actually in the file. Um, so, uh, yeah, just, that's definitely got advantages. We are very even in this example, the word list was three megabytes in size just by itself. So, yep. Yeah. Um, so the, the shape of things here is, so it just it gets the input word. So there's, this is slightly convoluted because I've kind of mashed it all into one line, but the key point to highlight here is that there is a way in Power Query to like use uh, something from, like something that you enter in the grid as an input. So in this case, you know, like I said, I showed you the parameter table that it has the location of the file and it has the input word. And so this is just getting that word uppercasing it and then figuring out its length and it imports the word list. So, you know, here's the path, get it, rename the columns, add a column for the length, uh, filter by length because we only need words that are no longer than the input word, uh, sort by length, uh, uppercase the text. In this case, the word list was in uppercase, but, you know, Power Query is case sensitive uh, for a lot of its text functions. So that's why I just I uppercase both just to make sure there's no ambiguity of the word list change or anything like that. And then again, it's this piece of like add counts for each letter. Um, I remembered as I was saying that I'm almost certain you can do this 10 times more neatly with uh, with a function called list.accumulate, but I have never <laughs> used it in the real world. Uh, and so th the way I actually wrote these to avoid, like, I mean, on occasion, I have just written these by going down, you know, going, okay, now this is C, now this is D, now this is da, 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 uh, which is, fine if you need to do it quickly, but also somewhat error prone. Um, yeah. the, the way I actually wrote these formulas was by doing one and then copying the line, putting it into a line in a spreadsheet and then making that a formula based on whatever, you know, oh, a, yeah. B, a, 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 B, and so the A here, the B here and the B here were all formula driven and then copy that down 25 more rows and then pasted it back in here and, uh, and, and it worked. Uh, I'm imagining, then, yeah, like, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know if it's possible in Power Query, it probably is, but in VBA, you could do it like this, or you could do it, say, a, a for next loop, where you could probably just use, you know, the ASCII code ranging from 65 up to 90 or something, you know, for the 26 capital letters. And Yep, uh, yep. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure that you can, you can replace all of this with one clever list dot accumulate, but yeah, I've, I've but I, for a quick and dirty right recreational <laughs> exercise like this, my first instinct would probably be to do it the way you've done it rather than try to, you know, write it at a more <laughs> professional, neat yep. shorter. Uh, but so then once, once you have that, so th this generates that same table that has, you know, the word, the length, and then how many of each of the 26 letters are in it. And then this line here just says filter that to say, you know, A has to be less than or equal to, again, it's just the power query version of that same formula, the length of the word minus the length of the word if you replace all the A's. So, you know, the number of A's has to be manageable and the number of B's has to be manageable and so on. And this is just one very yeah. long formula that goes all the way out. Again, I think I made this in Excel, uh, like in, in the grid and then pasted it in here. Uh, and then it just removes the other columns and then you just get left with something pretty simple. And like I said, my computer is not the fastest, but uh, just to give you a sense of um, running speed. Uh, sorry, no, not that I meant. Refresh. So it runs a new query every time you change the input word, it, it sort of executes the query again and yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, so it, it'll it'll refresh anytime you tell it to whether or not, uh, yeah. whether or not yeah. it has speed. Um, but yeah, so like, for example, you know, there's no way to know from in the file, like I could have edited the text file yeah. 
Um, so there's, there's no way to tell other than kind of looking at a timestamp whether the query is current. Um, well, but, the trick is, can you do it? Can it update in 30 seconds? Because if you're trying to cheat at the letters and numbers game playing from home, you only get 30 seconds. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's running pretty slow now. It's, it's not impressive. But I, I like it regardless of you know power query or formulas. Um, just the conceptual approach of you matching the dictionary letters and using the wildcard searches and so on was was again quite different to either of the approaches I've highly different um and yet the approach you did if i you know i'm sure i could come up with a formula way to do that to go down that track and you know i'm sure you could come up with a power query way to go down the tracks i went down as well but it's yeah so it's it's kind of it's kind of cool there's many ways to to solve the problem even from a let's describe an algorithm on pen and paper approach, you know, independent of why are we going to program that algorithm using native formulas or Power Query or VBA? Mm. Yep. Yeah, well, we could uh, continue uh, on this uh, all uh, all day, but we do need to wrap We're up. We're out of time, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we had a couple of, uh, a, a couple of really quick comments uh, that, had, uh, that had popped up, if I can find my uh, yeah, I'm just, chat I'm again. Just reading them um yeah one asking whether we can predict next week's powerball number yeah i was trying to i was going to answer that but they only sent it to all the panelists and not everybody and yeah my answer was going yeah. to be just just use the rand function and that will give you just as good a result as any other algorithm that analyzed historical data to predict next week absolutely yeah. um, so did you want to have you to address any of those others really really quickly before we uh <laughs> oh, no, just, yeah there's some probably their observations just, yeah. The number yeah, of letters in each word in the dictionary by formula. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then you, you, you press F9 in the model, it's going to reach all of those. And then, yeah, the rest seem to be you know, comments about 32 uh, bit, 64 bit Excel. And yeah, I think um, that's been... my broad comment there is yeah, take an interest in learning how it all works under the hood, take an interest in the pros and cons of the different flavors of the software and uh, especially if you're ever writing things for other people that are going to get deployed on other computers, it becomes. Mm. All right. So thank you so much, guys. That was fascinating uh, for everyone else. Thank you for your participation. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. Uh, we are going to be doing another session uh, on the Financial Modelling World Cup that's actually coming up uh, in two days time on Wednesday. So I look forward to seeing you then. And for those of you who registered for this event on Zoom, we'll be sending out a copy of the of the files and uh, as well as the recording. So thank you, everyone. Was there anything you guys wanted to mention before we sign off? No, no I think that was it. I hope people enjoyed it. All right. No. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Really.